I'm curious about Homer, about Homer. What kind of work do you do? Are you doing on him? And um... well, it's connected. It's not directly on Homer, although it kind of it it sort of is. Um, I became very interested uh, in the lost works of Aristotle. Uh, all we we have everything Plato ever wrote. Everything Plato wrote has survived. Aristotle, we have about a fifth. Huh. of what he wrote and there but there's a lot of fragments and fragments can mean either works that survive from from antiquity that quote aristotle they quote a work that doesn't survive or i mean more literal papyrus fragments something like that and one of the works he wrote um and th there's kind of a big move now um there's there's one guy in particular i've been working closely with at the university of padua uh, the idea is that we need to reassess all the evidence for Aristotle's lost works. And the first work uh, I have, actually, I have my books here, or some of them anyway. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Is it yep. uh, Aristotle's Problem. lost Homeric yep. Problems? Yeah. yeah. Um, that, and, you know, it's Oxford University Press, and I mentioned the Ayn Rand Institute. Wow, always, that's great. Uh, that. That's what scholars of ancient philosophy look askance. But um, anyway, uh, so that was the first um, work of his, uh, a lost work that I've um, I published on and published a lot on, namely, uh, he wrote a work called The Homeric Problems, which was uh, said to be in six books. That would have been six papyrus rolls, scrolls. So, you know, it'd be a substantial work. And um, it was probably, I mean, there was emerging a kind of culture where the they weren't sacred texts, but Homer's epics were very important to the, I mean, if you were an aristocratic young male, you know, being educated, you'd be reading and discussing um, uh, Homer. I mean, and, and and there'd be questions that would arise and these became known as Homeric problems. And it was probably Aristotle who got this started, but there may have been, um, and, and and partly it was, it was to discuss, you know, problematic texts or apparent contradictions in characterization, but also, there was a um there were critics of homer like plato in the republic says homer should be banned and uh and one response to that was to say well we'll 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 interpret him allegorically and aristotle rejected both of those um you know uh he shouldn't be banned and you know and for reasons deeper than just one's appraisal of of homer his view of art uh or literature anyway but um so i i became really fascinated in that uh, and um, I've published, well, this one book uh, and then uh, several articles where most of the fragments survive in the margins of the the manuscripts of Homer that have survived to the Middle Ages. Uh, oh. Right. And so they're very, you know, they're difficult to read. And uh, but I, I rely on mostly I rely on other scholars for that. But some of the some of the stuff I've looked at directly and I'm just find that really fascinating uh, to to dig up this old Aristotle and, and try to, um, uh, you know, figure out what, what's going on. And, uh, so I'm, so I'm curious now. So, so what, so we're all familiar, I think with, uh, with, um, with Homer. So what, what, what value did Aristotle see in Homer that, that obviously Plato did not? Well, um, Aristotle thought that Homer was the, he was the paradigm of epic poetry. I mean, because Aristotle wrote a work in two books called The Poetics. The second book is Lost, which was probably, it was almost, it was certainly on comedy, you know, ancient Greek comedy, uh, the plays like Aristophanes yeah. yep. and stuff. And also um, similar kinds of, uh, like there's a, there was a, a genre called lampoons. Um, and he probably talked about that as well. But the first, uh, the the first book of the Poetics, which is the one that survives, is on tragedy and epic, and especially tragedy. But um, which I think Aristotle probably, I think he regarded as a superior form um, to to Homer. But he did think Homer was a genius and brilliant. And um, uh, the main difference, though, because he thought he he created. A, I mean, he he went under the assumption that there was one man name Homer, who wrote both of these, who wrote both of these plays. I mean, so they're Homer, modern Homeric scholars have very different views of those things. But um, he, he, and there is a, I mean, there's a reason why he keeps getting translated. He's continually discussed. I find there's something really fascinating about these Homeric stories yep. 
and they really um, they contain something of value for understanding not just the the kind of the archaic period that it, it, it emerged out of or the Bronze Age culture that it talks about, but the classical period because they regarded it as so such a value. Plato's problem was that um, he thought Plato thought literature and art generally representational art was anti-philosophical. He thought that, you know, the forms, uh, I don't know how much into Plato's metaphysics you want to get, but Go he was it. a metaphysical dualist. Yeah. Plato thought there that this world, the world of our bodies and physical reality was a quasi-real re quasi realm, um, a, a reflection of a greater, you know, realm, the world of the forms or the ideas, call them forms, I think is better. And this world is a kind of imperfect reflection of the world of forms. Art, he thought, representational art was a copy of a copy. It was a it was an imitation of this reality, this material world. And so he thought it was the opposite of philosophy. Philosophy is supposed to, for Plato, it involves turning your back on the evidence of the senses, th trying to think more abstractly using re pure reason, reason alone. That's why he thought mathematics was so important because you know mathematics. It seems you know, it might seem that that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Turning your back on the senses using pure reason, and then in kind of um, you suddenly will will grasp the forms. Or I, I'm being a little, you know, it, it's it's more complicated than that. But yes. that's kind of a story. But the idea is that art does not contribute to that at all. Art is um, it's a copy of a copy. It's someone a painter uses his sense perception to look at an artwork and he copies it. And um, it's often driven by emotion. And, Aris and Plato seems to think that when their genius did happen, it was because the gods were speaking through, it was kind of divine inspiration. It couldn't have been reason that was responsible for it. And that explains why, since it's twice removed from reality, twice removed from the truth, it's dangerous. I mean, after all, you have, you have Homer has these gods that do horrible things. Let's face it; they're not um, Christian gods, and um, well, they I don't be... know. A Christian God does pretty horrible things. Well, yeah. Well, he does different horrible things. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, he becomes a man and um, gives Kills us a himself. philosophy that that uh, destroys us. Whereas, you know, um, Poseidon, you know, pretends to be a human being, and the next thing you know, he's abusing women or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and also, I mean, what really, uh, for example. Uh, Plato was in the Republic. He um, particularly was found dangerous. That brilliant line of Achilles: when Achilles is in Hades, he's in the afterlife. He's kind of got the run of the place. And Odysseus, um, you know, he, Odysseus. This is in uh, um, Book Eleven of the Odyssey. Odysseus sees him and says, "You know, you, you don't have much to complain about. I mean, yeah, you're dead and you're here, but at least you know you, you're pretty big man on campus around." Uh, Hades and Odysseus, uh, sorry, uh, and Achilles says to that's did I mix that up? Yeah, Achilles says Achilles. to to Odysseus, I don't want to hear that, Odysseus. I would rather be the slave of a poor man on earth than king of all of the afterlife, because for the Greeks, the afterlife it's just your memories. You know, they go to some place and you have, but but for the the ancient Greeks, the earth is where it happens. You want to be our hero? It has to happen here on Earth. And that's where all you have is, it's like being a grandmother saying, ask me about my grandchildren. You know, that's kind of what Hades is. Um, and for someone like Achilles, no, I don't want any of that. Uh, he dies young. He knew he was going to die young. He chose to go to Troy, having been told that he could stay in Ithaca with no fame, but live to an old age. He didn't want that. So, um, but that that's a very brilliant expression of the greek worldview and plato says no we don't want that in the republic that's going to teach soldiers that they shouldn't fear the, they, they don't want the afterlife you know we want warriors going into battle uh thinking there's something better when they die and you know so so aristotle's rejection of homer i think is not just on literary ground i mean aristotle's rejection sorry of plato on homer it's not just on literary grounds um, that Plato didn't understand. You know, Plato was pretty much, he had an idea of art as didactic. 
um, you know, it's 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 a more it's a morality play or something like that's a little mm-hmm. unsophisticated, but that's sort of pretty much his view. And if you're going to have art at all, it's got to um, it's it's got to encourage uh, proper um, morals. And for Aristotle, I think uh, he looked at Homer in a very different way. Um, I mean, I don't know. You know, it, it's a story. It has a plot in his view. Um, it has characterization. You see, you can talk about this. That's kind of what these Homeric problems probably were, raising questions. You know, Odysseus would, I mean, one of the ones I just have, I have a paper coming out in, uh, well, God knows when these things come out because I may, I send them in on the deadline and then, you yeah. know, who knows what academics do. Um, but it's, uh, uh, Calypso offered uh, Odysseus, you know, on the eye on Calypso's island, offered Odysseus immortality. And he ref- he said no. And so that became one of these problems. Why did Odysseus refuse immortality? Because Calypso, and it's not boring Christian heaven. Calypso yeah. says, stay with me. You will be immortal. You will have pleasure in my bed every night. You will not grow old. And he says no. <laughs> and, you know, he, I'll take Penelope uh, for all her aging. And so the question is why? And, um, you know, some people think, yeah, why? And and I think it, it relates to that point about Achilles. Um, it sounds really nice at first, <laughs> right? You know, a Calypso is a nymph. Um, yep. She doesn't grow old. You know, she's she's kind of semi, it's supposed to be uh, um, really good looking, of course. Uh, and she says that I'm, you know, I'm not growing old like Penelope, right? Uh, mm. And, uh, but again, for Odysseus, to be a man means to achieve things. And now this was probably, you know, part of the Greek culture that that um, we might uh, you know, pause over, but, and to achieve things that other people see as great uh, accomplishments. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really important. And if, if, um, the, if, if staying on an island with this really hot goddess for the rest of my life means that I'm going to disappear uh, you know, I'll be this obscure figure that no one's ever heard of again. Nah, I'm not going to do it. Um, and there were other reasons as well. And and people talk about, I mean, uh, there was one view was that, well, Odysseus was really smart and he knew that Calypso couldn't grant him immortality. Only Zeus can do that. <laughs> so that's, that's not as interesting uh, an answer. And, and Aristotle's no. answers aren't really brilliant. You know, they're not as interesting as some of the other ones that might occur to us, but... Um, so, um, so of these uh, lost works, I mean, you've you've got the one book on on um, on Homer. What else are you guys expecting to find? Um, well, a lot of it is not. Um, well, the the work I'm I'm devoting most of my time to now is one called the Zoica, which means animal matters. And one of the last conversations I had with Alan Godhelf was, you know, we really someone needs to do more work on that. And I thought, yeah, yeah, someone ought to. You know, I, I'm. I wonder who it's going to be. I, you know, I, I wasn't. This, this, you know, this was. Yeah. I think the last year of Alan's life, and and he's been gone what ten years, something like that. Um, I think uh, twenty thirteen. So, um, uh, so, but but I I then started to work on that. Um, I I thought this is. I kind of stumbled across it somewhere, and I started looking at the evidence and wasn't satisfied with with. Um, what had been written on it in the past. So I um, I started working on it and I've, I have a couple publications. One, one publication has appeared already. I have a couple in progress, but most of all I'm working, uh, what I wanna do is as part of this big project centered in Padua, in the University of Padua, um, I, I want to have an edition of the, 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 the Greek and some Latin texts um, translation and commentary and uh that's what i'm working on now and i'm hoping that'll in another year or so that'll uh be finished now i will say this i think it's a more boring work because what i argue is that this was and one of the things alan talks about in his works on aristotle's biology is that there was a collection of data stage an organization of data and then the explanation of the data the causal explanation and we have his works on the the collection of of data that hasn't survived. Well, that's what I argue that the Zoica is, the animal matters is, and I'm um, um, 
one of the things I spent a week at, in Padua, which is really lovely because it's 30 minute uh, um, train ride to Venice, which yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and it's a beautiful city in its own right. Uh, what I did is I um, I worked with some of the people there and, and I looked at, um, you know, I gave a, a two hour presentation of, you know, um, the evidence for Aristotle's Zoica in um, Byzantine etymological works. And, you know, so I'm scraping the barrel right now. I mean, there's not a lot of stuff left. I've collected uh, the, the material that exists, but I'm finding it a fascinating activity. Although if I had to choose which work would you like to be discovered in the sands of Egypt or in, you know, papyrus yep. or, or in Herculaneum, I definitely want the work on Homer. I think it'd be a much more fascinating work. So, uh, do we know why uh, Plato's survived and, and Aristotle didn't? I think the main reason is um, Aristotle, I think, uh, he appeared at the wrong time in a way. Um, and it's a complicated story. But when, when Aristotle died, um, there's stories about um, his library going to Theophrastus and Theophrastus giving it to his heirs, and they were neglecting the work. And um, this is why the archives is really important. <laughs> and neglecting the work, and then it show it, it, it was lost until um, fragments of it uh, appeared in Rome uh, uh, centuries later. And there's those are the stories we get from Plutarch and and um, Athena these, these these ancient authors. And there's disputes about how much we should we could rely on. I, I don't think. It, I think his Lyceum, which continued after he died, of course, um, I think it had, it must have had a copy of, of most of his works. Um, I, yeah, I find that strange that it wouldn't. But it just happened that the um, the rival school, Plato's Academy, which continued, Plato's Academy was in continuous operation from when he found it until 520, 529 AD when Justinian um, um, banned the teaching of any pagan philosophy. Mm -hmm. Aristotle's school didn't do so well. That is, his Lyceum continued to to work, and that's one of the things I'm interested in uh, now. Is um, I become more involved in in Project Theophrastus. That's uh, recovering as much evidence as we can about the 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 followers of Aristotle in the early uh, Lyceum. But I think his philosophy just wasn't as popular. It didn't catch on as much during the Hellenistic period after, you know, uh, when when things changed very um, pretty radically from the classical period to the Hellenistic after the the death of um, Alexander the Great, and even before that with the, the, the kind of the Macedonian conquest of the whole, um, you know, the whole world in effect, ultimately. Um, and, and, and so what you get is Plato's philosophy uh, I think had was more popular, and then the new philosophies that emerged: Stoicism, Epicureanism, uh, a bit later skepticism of uh, various forms. Uh, these um, had, I think, they were more influential, mm -hmm. and I think, uh, and then a lot. I think a lot of the works just may have been not as interesting because Aristotle was, you know, he wrote works that were probably collections of data about animals and collections of data about um uh well, one of the works I, i'm i'm interested in is um aristotle wrote a work on weather signs and you know um that is predicting predicting the weather based on the you know what what the birds are doing and what animal yeah, you know the, yeah. if the centipedes are, are running towards the wall you know maybe there's going to rain and i think um he didn't believe all this stuff but he thought that if a lot of people believed it, we should collect this data and see if there's anything to it so i imagine some of those works were rather uninteresting to philosophers. In fact, it's it's not philosophy at all, at, at all as we know it. And since it's very expensive to copy works, and uh, I think they weren't interesting um, to a lot of people, and and so it's um, um, that's what I think happened. On the other hand, it's not just boring stuff. I mean, he wrote dialogues on justice, on um, on he wrote you know a, a treatise on on the River Nile and you know an explanation of it. He has all these uh, um, interesting works that are. Uh, he wrote works on medicine. I actually I published an article on on a possible fragments from from that work as well. Um, but so I think it was uh, a lack of interest in some of his works uh, that that his 
school was not as influential as the other ones. Plus, Plato wrote uh, a set number of, you know, fairly, uh, however, 34, whatever it is, dialogues. And um, no, it's more, it's going to be more than that. But um, they kind of were carried on by his school and, you know, they never really went out of favor. And by the mm -hmm. time you get to the period, I mean, the crucial period is when they start copying papyrus onto um, vellum or or different, you know, kind of you know, into manuscript books that um, it's very expensive process. And the ones that people weren't interested in uh, got lost uh, 